Because the mucosal immune system works locally. It's not a whole generalized all or none process. It works in the, in the, in the micro environment. Um, now, so that's my prejudice. Okay, what's the autoimmune theory? Well, autoimmunity to me means that you have to have a self-antigen against which a dysregulated, destructive immune response is directed. Quick historical background, I mean very quick. The early 1880s, they identified the causal agent for mycobacterium, well, for leprosy, which is mycobacterium leprae. Shortly thereafter, it was mycobacterium tuberculosis, or what we now know as tuberculosis. Shortly thereafter, they recognized that, that tuberculosis not just affects the lungs, but can also infect the, uh, the, the, the intestines. So you had intestinal tuberculosis, which, which causes chronic inflammation and granulomas. Usually it's described as caseating granulomas, but you can have tuberculosis with non-caseating granulomas. And most likely that has to do with, well, clearly that has to do with the interplay of the host immune response with the mycobacterium itself, how much species difference in the mycobacteria, I certainly don't know. But by the turn of the century, this is around the 1900s, they had recognized that there was a disease that looked just like intestinal tuberculosis, only they couldn't find any evidence for the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So in 1913, Thomas Dalziel wrote a paper saying, hey, wonders if this unknown chronic inflammatory granulomas disease that looks like intestinal tuberculosis isn't caused by pseudotuberculosis which is now known as mycobacterium maybe and paratuberculosis. And that's the way the argument went on at the beginning of the 20th century. By 1932, Crohn, Ginsburg, and Oppenheimer wrote a, wrote a paper saying, hey, we've been arguing about this, we've been studying this for a while, we find no proof at all that this is an infectious disease, we can't prove that this is a mycobacteria disease, let's just step back and study this as a disease in its own right. Now, I think that was a reasonable approach in 1932, given the technology. The problem is, how did the medical community respond? The medical community responded by saying, we've looked for an infectious agent, we didn't find it, therefore it isn't an infectious disease. And I think that's where we went wrong. Uh, there were some people that continued to say, hey, it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's probably an infectious disease. But the vast majority just, just went along with, no, let's look for other hypotheses. The 1950s was the era of psychiatry. And sure enough, this idiopathic disease that you couldn't prove was or was not an infectious disease, they said, hey, there is a huge psychological impact on this disease. This is a psychiatric disease. And I heard from very reputable sources, I haven't seen it written, I've, although I've looked, but it was from the fellow research in the disease at the NIH, he says that in Paris they actually tried frontal lobotomies to see if it, it had any effect. Well, they didn't do too many of those because it didn't have an effect. Uh, but the next, but, you know, it was a wonderful disease. It was something that you couldn't prove or disprove was psychiatric, and clearly there was an influence of the mind to the body. The next hypothesis that came along was the autoimmune hypothesis. And certainly there's inflammation, certainly the immune system's involved, certainly it's a destructive immune. And in the late 60s and early 70s, where we knew very little about the immune system, it seemed very, very logical. Hey, this looks like an autoimmune disease. However, there was never a self-antigen identified, at least that I know of. And so, but, you write about it, the herd jumps on it, everybody talks about it, de facto Crohn's disease became an autoimmune disease. And that's the way it's categorized in our textbooks, under autoimmunity, and everybody has been talking about it, except for the last 10 to 15 years, when the people researching Crohn's disease have abandoned that theory. They do not say that it's an autoimmune disease. They shifted the goalpost a little bit, and they say that this is a disease of immune dysregulation, 
triggered by an environmental factor somehow. I agree with that. But to me, that's not an ideologic hypothesis. That's simply a description of, of what it is. Uh, and I go along with that totally. Then the third, um, then there's this concept that actually Crohn's disease is an immune deficiency disease. And I think Tim Bull did a good job of showing, although we didn't go into the details, there's a lot of work showing on that there is an immune deficient state associated with Crohn's disease. There are papers that came out of France where I read this, and I absolutely agree with them that if, on a philosophical basis, you can argue that any infectious disease has a, has a partial immune deficient state associated with it. By definition, because if you really had an effective immune system, and it saw a microbe that was trying to get into the body, the immune system would take care of it, and you wouldn't have the disease. So anytime you have any virus or any, any bacteria that's successful, you can say it, there's, there's, there's a relative immune deficient state against this. Um, you know, and that is a matter of spectrum, that is a matter of disease. That's, well, that's, that's the concept there. But we go on and there's, there's been a lot of evidence for neutrophil, um, less response in neutrophils, failures of uh, the macrophages to adequately clear bacteria. And so there's, that, that's all I'll say there. But I think immune deficiency is a part of this disease. Um, now there are two, two agents that have garnered the most support. One is the adherent invasive E. coli. Um, Arlette Darfur Michaud in France is the one that's championing that, picked up by different labs around the, uh, around the world. And they have shown a strain of E. coli that invades, proliferates, survives inside of macrophages in the terminal ileum. And associated with that, you get inflammatory cytokine responses. So invasive E. coli is playing a role in Crohn's disease. What the role is, don't know. Is it an etiologic agent? In some cases, is it a secondary infection? Don't know. And the other, of course, is MAP. Um, and uh, the same arguments go. Tim Bull spoke on this yesterday. I won't, won't push it so much. Now, as a hypothesis, I didn't put the most quoted cause of Crohn's disease, that of there being an immune dysregulation, because I think that's a descriptive factor rather than a true etiologic um, hypothesis. Now, the pathogenesis, fit pathophysiology and pathology. Really the explanations, depending on whoever the speaker's bias is, is going to depend on his biases and what paradigm he's using to organize and give meaning to the data that he brings in. But certainly the one thing that everybody agrees on is that there are genetic factors, environmental factors. Uh, this is an acid, an acquired chronic inflammatory disease and there's immune dysregulation. Now as far as it being an acquired chronic inflammatory disease, you've got to ask, why does somebody that's been healthy into their 25 or 30 or 40 or 8 suddenly come down with this disease? Well, when I think of an acquired disease, I'm usually thinking about an infectious disease. Um, and again, you get your wide, your broad, broad spectrum of, um, of clinical manifestations. Here's just a picture of the colon, so you can see it. Um, won't go through it too, too much, but in normally you don't have a lot of, um, of lymphocytes, although you do have some. This is a picture of the normal small bowel with the villi, and what Crohn's disease will, will give you is inflammation in the lamina propria and deep in the submucosa, and as that inflammation gets um, becomes organized, you will get first, initially right at the crypts, you will see giant cells forming, which are macrophages coming together and coalescing. And then as it organizes more, you'll get giant cells surrounded by, by lymphocytes into a full granuloma. Now the granulomas are not caseating, but granulomas form, as I understand it, when, uh, when there's a foreign antigen there that the body can't get rid of. 